Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Samaya and I'll be the facilitator for today's session. Um, as everyone's joining, I'd just love to hear more about you and where you're from. So feel free to make use of the chat and uh, feel free to add you know, where you're from, where you are in your design journey or creative journey uh, and what you're looking to get out of the session. So it'll give me some idea on uh, you know, how I can best facilitate this. Um, but excited to get started. So uh, just, you know, feel free to introduce yourselves and uh, excited to get to know you. And what we'll do is we'll just wait for a couple more minutes to see who joins and then we'll get started. All right, welcome for the folks just joining. Uh, uh, my name is Samaya and I'm going to be the facilitator for today and would love it if you could introduce yourselves in the chat. So let me know where you're from uh, and where you are in your creative journey. Uh, hello, Sonia, great to meet you from Texas. Welcome, great to, be, great to hear from other folks as well. And we'll get started in a couple minutes. Hello, Humberto from Ecuador. Uh, welcome. Great to see uh, an international crowd today. Hello, welcome from California and Michigan. Welcome, Jordan from NYC. Great to meet you. Welcome, Shannon from Chicago, uh, and but living in South Carolina. Welcome. Welcome from Mexico and Nigeria. This is a really cool crowd today. All right, we'll just give it a couple more minutes. What I'm going to do is pull up the presentation for today. Right. Right, I'll keep the chat open, but can everyone see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up or just type yes into the chat if you can see the screen. Perfect, all right, thank you so much. Welcome everyone to Design Thinking for Living a Creative Life. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to go through some workshop ground rules today for the first five minutes, do some introductions like we're doing right now. Uh, and then what we're gonna talk about is an introduction to design thinking because that'll be the foundation of how we want to live our most creative life. And then we're going to dive into a mirror board activity where we're going to brainstorm how we can live a more creative life together and really think through, through the barriers, the problems around not living a life that is as creative as we would like it to be. And so uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. My name is Samea, I'm the workshop facilitator. I have over seven years of UX design experience at startups and agencies and corporations, and I'm currently the co-founder of ID8 Labs. Some ground rules before we begin. I'd love it if you could stay on mute unless you have something you would like to contribute. As always, you can make use of the chat uh, to you know, voice a problem or a concern or an idea uh, or something you'd like to share with the larger group. Uh, the most important rule of all is just to be kind and build on each other's ideas. So uh, part of this session is going to be a workshop. So we're really trying to create an environment that feels safe where you can share both good and bad ideas and really speak as openly and freely as you can. Uh, so again, this is a no judgment zone. And the purpose of this session is just to make our time together as intimate as possible, share ideas on topics that we're passionate about, find like-minded folks, and then of course, get a small taste of design and creative thinking. 
The session is not to start thinking about solutions right away. In the UX world, you know that, you know, a lot of times we spend most of our time gaining context about a problem and then coming up with solutions at the very end. So this will be very similar. We're going to really address what are parts of our lives where we don't feel creative and why don't we feel creative? And we're going to really dive into that problem rather than trying to come up with solutions right away. And if you'd like to learn more about design, I'd really recommend going to www.idlabs.co uh, and join our Slack community there. We have over 6,000 aspiring designers and design thinkers on the channel, uh, and we'd love it if you could join the community as well. And most of all, I hope that you leave the session feeling empowered or having a new perspective in mind and empowered to act on some of the ideas you hear today. And if not, if you're not ready to act just yet, I hope it lets you start to rethink things, rethink things about who you are, how you could lead a more creative life. Uh, and if you are a part of the design world, you might be wondering why we do workshops like this one. And it's really to bring people of different points of views together to get them to agree on priorities and then um, to really have fun and have a more playful mindset towards problem solving and ideation. And so with that, I'm going to dive into a very quick introduction to design thinking. We're at 4.35 uh, and we're going to start with what is design thinking in the first place? So there's a very boring definition from the Interaction Design Foundation saying that design thinking is a nonlinear iterative process that teams use to understand users, challenge assumptions, redefine problems and create innovative solutions to prototype and test. Uh, so that's quite a mouthful. Uh, at ID8 Labs, we like to simplify things, make design jargon more accessible. And so we could simplify that to just saying, it's the process of collaborating to define problems and then find those innovative solutions. And what you'll probably have seen is that the UX design process consists of about five or six steps. It starts with empathizing with users to really understand who they are, start to define problems that we need to solve for our users, ideate on those problems, find potential solutions, prototype them, and then test them and implement them in the real world. So the design thinking process could take as little as two weeks to complete, depending on what product or feature you would like to launch, or it could take two months, or it could take two years. So it's kind of nebulous. And there might be other ways of looking at the design thinking process as well. There's also this double diamond visualization. And this is what we use for our four month live UX course. So in the first six weeks of the course, we really focus on problem finding and need finding. And we really want to make sure we're designing the right thing. So all of our cohort members choose a project topic of their choice something that they're interested in, passionate about. And by week six, their midterms, they've defined an MVP solution for their problem. So to give you an idea of the kind of creative solutions and problems they come up with, uh, one of our cohort members chose to focus on domestic violence in Peru and how to help women who are going through a really tough situation situation with their family get the help that they need. And so that was a really sensitive solution that also required a lot of creativity and, and thoughtfulness when approaching that problem. On a more serious side, um, during the pandemic, one of our cohort members chose to focusing on understanding grief and normalizing grief because grief is not talked about. Uh, and so she wanted to make sure that folks who were grieving had the resources that they needed uh, as they were going through that process. We've also had more lighthearted topics chosen by cohort members like uh, first time bird owners, uh, dog sitting, uh, we've also had really interesting uh, niche topics like how do how might we provide digital experiences for members of the kink and BDSM community and what would they like in their world. Uh, so there's been a lot of really interesting project topics and then once you really found the right problem to solve, that's when you start designing things right. So you can come up with multiple iterations of a solution, multiple visualizations of what that solution could look like, uh, start to prototype it, test it, and then finally converge on one solution, one look for your product. These are just different ways to imagine what design thinking looks like, um, but it's the same process. 
But what I really believe is design thinking looks a lot more like this. And probably when we're trying to live creative lives, this is what it looks like. There's a lot of uncertainty and pattern finding and need finding in the beginning of our processes. And there's going to be a lot of trial and error. Uh, you know, if you're someone who's afraid of failure, this might not be the most comfortable moment for you. But really as designers, we have to take a more entrepreneurial approach and be comfortable with failing or rethinking how we usually think of things until we get to a state of clarity where we're feeling more confident that we understand the problem and know what unique specific problem we're trying to solve. And so really what we're trying to do is reframing traditional perspectives as we move from problem to solution. We're trying to look at the problem from a very different angle. And we also need to really communicate our insights in a way that frames both the problem and solution in a new way, from a new perspective, in a new mindset. So it's really when you simplify design thinking, it's all about just finding new ways to look at the world and then talk about it. And so that's what I would like us to do today when we want to design a more creative life. How can we rethink creativity and what creativity means to us? How can we have a new perspective on our problems uh, and think about our problems from a different point of view? It's also a really interdisciplinary approach to finding problems and solutions. So design thinking considers desirability, viability, and feasibility. So from a desirability perspective, we're considering the user's perspective. Does it fill their need? Does it fit into people's lives? Can we make them want it? From a viability perspective, we're really thinking about the business needs and the business stakeholders. So does this align with the business's goals? What's the return on investment? And then from feasibility standpoint, we're thinking about the tech and operations of the business. So what are the tech constraints? What does it take to operate this type of business or create this type of solution? So with that, I'm going to now transition a little bit into the laws of UX and how design thinking relates to UX in particular. So you might have heard of Jacob's Law that users spend most of their time on websites and other than ours, other websites, other than our own products application. So basically our mental models are built off of what we're seeing in other websites, which is why as UX designers in particular, and even product designers, we don't want to deviate too much from existing mental models of the world. We just want to have a slightly new spin on it. Uh, and so that's what uh, is really important to think about when also thinking about our creativity. Uh, are you, you know, really not creative or are you just, um, you know, branding yourself as not creative because, uh, you know, it doesn't fit the traditional definition of creativity. Uh, and so one really good example of Jacob's Law uh, from my own experience is when I was building a smart TV system, we deliberately, and I believe the designers, you know, as I was looking through the smart TV, I noticed our design looked a lot like Netflix. And that's a no brainer because Netflix was one of the first streaming platforms. And so the design system of that smart TV was really modeled after Netflix over other streaming services like Amazon or Hulu or Disney Plus or, you know, whichever other platforms are out there. Uh, and I thought that was really interesting because the UX of Netflix was so good. It was so simple. Uh, and so whether subconsciously or consciously, the design system of the smart TV copied Netflix in some ways, even though they're completely different products, completely different uh, business models. Uh, it's really interesting to see Jacob's Law at play. And to continue Jacob's Law, uh, Netflix also continues to innovate with their product. So they were starting to realize back in 2021 that they were losing viewers to platforms like TikTok and maybe even Spotify. So Netflix started to actually study Spotify and this idea of just getting one content piece in front of you all the time. And they also started to study older patterns of behavior like channel surfing on a TV. And they came up with this new feature called play something that you see here. So if you're ever unsure about what to watch, you can just click play something on Netflix and it will recommend uh, its first 
you know, recommendation for you based on what you've watched in the past. And so it's pulling Netflix, you know, indirectly was looking at other competitors or indirect competitors like TikTok and even Spotify to understand what's the algorithm like, how do you shuffle things to place one piece of content in front of a person that they're most likely to like. So remember that, you know, as you're thinking about your own creativity, you don't need to reinvent the wheel in, in most cases. Can you design something that is so good that it's almost invisible? So with the case of Netflix or TikTok, you don't even think about the controls. You just have a piece of content in front of you. Uh, and however, on other streaming platforms, you might have to think about where you're navigating, what piece of content you need to watch next. And it takes you time to get to what you want. So can your design be so good that it's almost invisible? With that, we're going to talk a little bit about Hicks Law. And Hicks Law states that the time to make decisions increases with the amount of complexity and number of choices in a platform. So that was kind of the paradox of choice. That's what Netflix was faced with at one point back in 2021 when they first launched Play Something. And, you know, initially to grow their business, they had to provide a lot of choices. They had to provide a lot of movie content pieces because they were competing with, uh, you know, uh, companies like Blockbuster, which is now out of business, but they really had to show the volume of content. But after a point, they got so big that they had to find ways to uh, tag their content, constrain their content, so that it was easy to find and easy to surface. And so they needed more and more solutions to just place one piece of content in front of their users right away, almost like a TikTok model, just one piece of content at a time rather than a whole repository of content pieces. The king or queen of Hicks Law, I would say, is Amazon. Uh, so just think about how Amazon makes purchases so and so easy to complete, right? They actually have a patented one-click buy where you can just click one click and you've bought something. And actually, Apple has licensed Amazon's one-click buy for their Apple Music. That's the only other place where you see that. Uh, and it's because of, you know, Amazon's tech. And so Amazon has simplified the checkout process so much that they've just, you know, optimized it and then therefore they make more money. Uh, just think about how easy it is to order something on Alexa even. There's five-year-olds who are ordering, you know, toys on Alexa or really expensive items against their parents' wishes. And that's because Amazon just makes it that easy. And so as we're thinking about these UX laws and design thinking, we also start need to take a more ethical design approach to it. So, you know, why is it that we trust certain platforms, but we don't trust other platforms? Uh, these are all very successful brands, but somehow we feel a little icky when we think about Amazon, but we don't feel as icky when we think about Netflix or Spotify, perhaps because Netflix and Spotify might be using our data in a more thoughtful manner, in a more, in a manner that, you know, where we can actually give our consent to them using the data. But Amazon and um, doesn't seem to do that and we start to lose trust in Amazon. So that's just something to think about. Now there's, you know, you know, ethical design is more at the forefront in our field. And you see platforms that are losing the trust of their audience because they've um, been unethical in the past or they haven't really thought through the user's needs in the past or the user's values in the past. So it really, you know, boils down to emotion and ethics. Can we design things with an emotional perspective and in an ethical manner? All right, yes, and Daniel, uh, I was just reading the comment, yes, Apple's implement implementation of one click using Apple Pay on their online store is like magic. Yes, it makes things so easy, and that's why they're making, I bet you, billions and billions of dollars. And so with that, I'm going to walk through our Miro board activity for today. Uh, now that you've had a chance to think a little bit about design thinking, how can we apply design thinking to live a more creative life? So what I'm going to do is I will be sharing a Miro board with three boards. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to start with exercise one, and we're going to define our problems with creativity and where we're blocked creative, 
in a creative manner perspective. And then we're going to start to compare our problems, vote on problems, and start to see, is there are there problems that are boiling up a lot more than usual? And then we can start to generate some solutions. So this is all a bit nebulous. So what I'm gonna do is uh, stop sharing and then give you a link to that Miro board. And it'll make a lot more sense once we actually start doing the activity. So just give me one sec. Right. So this is the link to the Miro board and I'm going to share my screen again. And as everyone hops onto the, the Miro board, what I would love for everyone to do is hover over this first board, the uh, define a problem, uh, and we can start from there. So what we would like to do is take this problem statement and really come up with our own problem statement around how we could live a more creative life. So users or I want to take a specific action, but problem because cause of problem. This makes them or me feel a certain emotion around the problem. So that's our problem statement. Oh, no access. All right, give me a sec. Uh, I see, all right. Thank you for pointing that out. I was wondering why no one was joining. I was like, oh no. <laughs> Just try that link. Perfect. And if you're completely new to Miro board, all we need to do is grab the sticky note icon, which is the fourth icon from the top in this left-hand side panel. Once I click on sticky notes, I can click on any color that I like and then drag and drop a sticky note. And then this lets me type up my own problem statement that I would like to flesh out. And the more specific I could be, the better. And the more emotional I can be about this problem statement, the better. So I'm just going to quickly brainstorm, and I would love it if you could do the same. So I want to become a more flu flowy dancer, but have problems, but don't have enough strength or flexibility because my body is not conditioned for it. This makes me feel overwhelmed and unsure about that's a very specific um, challenge I'm having in terms of my creative life. I like to dance on the side, uh, besides being a UX designer. Um, and so that's something I think about. Uh, but I'm really curious to hear where is everyone else being, feeling blocked in their creative lives or, or what's stopping you from not being as creative as you would like to be? I'll just give everyone maybe five minutes uh, to write their own problem statements and then we can uh, talk through some of them. to see a couple of good starts. And if you would like to be less personal and almost think about it like a product, you could do that as well. So maybe this is a, a problem you're noticing not just with yourself, 
but with other folks within that community, in which case I could sort of tweak my, my value proposition statement and I could become more specific. So I could say modern dancers, or I could say beginner modern dancers, because I'm trying to be as specific about my user group as possible, want to become more flowy and learning choreographies. So now we're almost thinking about it from a product design perspective and thinking about it like we would like to create a solution that helps that whole community. Oh, that's great to hear. I hear someone wants to draw but doesn't have the time to dedicate to sketching. Let's take a look at this one. I want to read more design books, but work is so stressing that during the weekends, I don't want to be reminded of work when during the week, I wish I had read them. Who wants to talk about this one? Who wrote this one? I did. Could you talk me through uh, <clears throat> how you're feeling and, and what made you, uh, you know, want to solve this particular problem? Sure, yeah. So I'm a content designer and this is a new discipline. So there's so much to read and I keep buying books that I like. Uh, and I end up only skimming them because during the weekend, like I don't want to think about work and, and it reminds me of work. And then during the week, I wish I had read them. Mm. And can you tell me, let's uh, maybe dive into this a little bit more. Can you tell me what's, what do you feel is the biggest blocker uh, for you to read these books during the week? Is it, you know, not enough time? Is it, what is it exactly during the week? <clears throat> yeah, not enough time. And also we work with many time zones. So sometimes I'm working really early in the morning and really late at night. So it, it, it's, yeah, it's kind of weird. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that that's hard, and I can imagine that you just don't want to do do anything re work related after those types of days. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. That makes sense. All right. Yeah. Interesting. Let's take a look at some of these other uh, statements. I want to be faster at iteration. I get stuck on ideas before being able to move to a new one. I want to get past ideas in my head faster. Ooh, this is a really good one. Who wrote this one? Who wrote that one? That would be me. That one. Awesome. Uh, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on uh, me? Hello? Uh, do you want to elaborate? Yeah, I when I iterate, um, I want to flesh out ideas more. Uh, I get stuck into in, um, in the details uh, of an idea, and I don't move on to a new one. I don't start thinking about new ideas or, or iterate to to um, yeah. I get stuck into fleshing out one idea, and then it takes up most of my time. Yeah, yeah, I can relate because that that's happened to me before. I fall in love with it, and yeah, I can relate because that. Um, I I don't move on from it, so that's a really great one. Great, and I see a couple of these that are also very similar to Calvin's statement. So here's one: I want to be fluid and think on my feet to solve problems, but I am entrenched in completing a boot camp course assignments and then seeking a new job interesting i want to express my ideas more but i'm afraid my ideas are odd or not interesting because it ha happened before this makes me have less confidence in myself who wrote this one this is a really good one
Anyone want to claim this, this orange sticky note? Okay. Uh, and uh, Catalea, I believe, uh, would you want to, oh, you can't talk. Okay, no worries. Uh, we'll come back to that one. But I'm curious if you could write in the chat, uh, what is making you feel less confident? Um, and what makes you feel like your ideas are uninteresting? Because that sounds like more of a self-limiting belief. It doesn't sound, you know, like it might be true. So it's just curious about that whenever you have a moment. All right, let's move to some of these. I want to finish a digital painting, but I never complete it because of my perfectionism. This makes me feel unmotivated to continue. Ooh, really good one. Um, who can talk about that a little bit more? Um, hi, it's Kasha. I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so I have an iPad, which gives me um, access to some cool apps. Um, I want to be able to do some a digital painting, but um, I never finish it because as soon as it starts to look um, like not quite right, then I won't continue it. Interesting. Okay. You know what? I'm actually going to start to group some of these sticky notes together because I actually think your problem and Calvin's problem are very similar. I think both of you have a theme around perfection, right? So there's this idea that I think Calvin's facing this too. Let's make it a a black sticky note. So we're going to try and come up with themes. Perfectionism, perfection. Um, so almost that perfectionist mindset as a blocker. So that could be interesting. That could be something that maybe you and Calvin talk through a little bit more because it almost sounds like there's this problem with iteration that you know um, that you don't feel comfortable seeing the rough and ugly version of your ideas. And in the UX design world, we spend most of our time on ugly designs. We spend a lot of time on wireframing, uh, sketches, hand-drawn sketches, and it's only about 20% of our time goes into that fully fleshed out, polished, high fidelity uh, picture. And I think that's really interesting to see. Um, it's almost like we spend ha all our time, 80% as UX designers, doing those raw brush strokes, those really hazy ones, and 20% really you know, perfecting it. So I wonder if maybe getting into that mindset more could help both of you with your, with your problems. Just something to think about. And let's take a look at Katalea's um, problem because sometimes when I collaborate, I feel like I'm headed towards a different directions than other people, or sometimes I feel my ideas get ignored or left out. Interesting. So maybe that actually is happening because of the way you're communicating your ideas or, um, or you know, that instead of the idea itself being, you know, a, a not as creative idea in quotes. So that could be something to think about as well. Um, let's go ahead and read some of these because now that I'm seeing a theme, let's start to see if we can find other themes within these, um, within these statements. Oh, I see one here. Okay, this is wanting to express. I want to create an interesting typeface, but I don't have any good idea to start with because I think my idea is not creative enough and I worry about how to, how successful the outcome could be. This makes me feel lost. Oh, wow. So speaking of twin ideas, we have a new theme here. I think Catalea, whoever wrote this one, um, has a very similar problem to you. So whoever wrote this one about the typeface, can you talk me through what you're feeling? Um, I feel like the existing typeface I'm looking at is really good and I think my idea is not that good and I cannot come up with some some concept to start with okay and I just feel like lost and don't know like what can I start with yeah it's interesting because you're the feeling around your problem really reminds me of Catalea's problem as well. And I think 
maybe here when we're trying to summarize this theme, it could be something like um, my ideas. I think that's interesting. All right, let's take a look at some of these here. Uh, I want to learn creative ways to UX design projects, but this but time is limited because my work takes up most of my weekdays. This makes me feel powerless in advancing my skills and experience. Who wants to talk about that? That's me. Um, yeah, I can talk about it. Um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the, the uh, UX designer and just started up uh, a few months ago. Um, I'm still, I have a lot to learn and try to increase you know, my ability and improve uh, my skill set. So uh, in a long process, I think it's uh, because I, my time pretty much mostly occupied by work during the week. And, uh, I left uh, me a very few time on weekend uh, to event skill. So I really sometimes like uh, on weekend I feel like hard. I don't have uh, energy to, yeah. to learn skill. And um, I really need to come up with like a, maybe like a study plan or just come up with some project to make myself uh, self uh, inspire and uh, to complete some project. So I can uh, continue to get new projects in my portfolio. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting because even though there's so many different types of problems, I really think your problem is a lot like this problem statement on reading design books. So here I think the similarity is not enough time or, or resources. So I'm just going to highlight exactly. that. And that is a common problem, regardless of what creative pursuit you want. Um, there's just not enough time. All right. Interesting. Let's take a look at some of these other ones. I want to transition into the design field, but most affordable resources are targeted at the basic same questions without any depth because this is what sells or gets entrance hooked. This makes me feel lost on how to grow further and advance my skills. That's a really well-written one. Who wrote that one? Uh, would you like to talk about it? Oh, okay. No worries. Uh, just to talk through it a little bit more, but we can we can pass through that. Uh, let's take a look at this one. I want to start a master degree in MIT, but I feel I need to improve my skills and portfolio to get accepted to the media art and technology research team. I'm afraid to be rejected. Oh, really good one. Fear of rejection. Um, I want to transition into the design field, but to get experience, you need a job, and to get a job, you need experience, because there are too many people in the game. This makes me feel anxious. Interesting. So I think a lot of these um, are very similar. So there's this feeling around uh, rejection and not being good enough because of the competition. Uh, so let's pull up a sticky note. So here the theme is too much competition. Fear of rejection. Interesting. I want to gain a full-time UX role, but I am balancing a job and internship and job applications. I feel drained and too busy. When I have free time, I want to be outside and see my friends. This makes me feel like I'm not doing enough in my job search or to advance my UX skills. Interesting. So this is again, not enough time. We'll put that here. All right. And I think a lot of people are gravitating to the not enough time. 
So as we're kind of going through this, uh, I'm curious, you know, um, about what theme is most exciting to you. So if you want to put a heart around a theme, then we can maybe dive into a little bit more detail about it. To vote on a theme, you can click on the sticky note and click on this uh, smiley face icon that you see that will pop up on the horizontal navigation panel. And then you can just heart each uh, whatever sticky note that you know you think is a good theme or a specific problem written by somebody. Um, so if everyone could go ahead and think through what are what are the themes that you know really resonate for them. All right, the votes are coming in. We have three people who are really identifying with the perfectionism as a blocker. All right, we have three people on too much competition and oh four, fear of rejection. Four. Oh wow, we're almost tied <laughs> with a lot of these ideas. That's interesting. And then three people on not enough time. Great, interesting to see. Right. Six votes. All right, so it sounds like these are the three big problems that people are really resonating with. Um, what I'm going to do is copy and paste these three themes onto the solution activities board uh, and we have about 20 minutes left where we can start to generate some solutions and then vote on those solutions. So I'm just going to pop these three themes here and then the last one was not enough time. And now we see what are the key problems, you know. It's funny because we all come from such different creative backgrounds, but we were able to relate to each other's problem statements uh, and find themes of commonalities based on the emotions behind those problems. And I think that's what's really exciting about design and emotional design in particular. Um, so in design thinking, we really, gravitate towards the emotional problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, and what I would like everyone to do now is just take different colored sticky notes and start to brainstorm ideas under each row for what are some possible solutions to these problems that you're seeing. And I think by seeing everyone's different solutions, we will all come away with a new perspective um, that could really help us with each of our own problems. Um, so for example, perfectionism. I have a solution for that. Can you take on a more entrepreneurial mindset? So actually startups love to fail. And can you celebrate failures? Can you learn to celebrate those failures? So one thing that you know really changed ID8 Labs as a business was we started to have fun with our failures. So whenever we put an experiment out there and it failed really, you know, abysmally, we actually would just laugh at it and we'd say, okay, now we can just move on to better ideas. So I think getting into that mindset was really crucial for us to start to succeed. And it also made us more creative designers because um, once we got into that mindset, we really pushed the boundaries of what we wanted to be able to do. Even in work, um, we would do A-B testing a lot. And so our, our, my boss would encourage me to, you know, cre create a bunch of different design concepts, some of them that were less risky, some of them that were more risky. Um, and she said, you know, it's okay to fail. We really want to fail so that we can just come up with better ideas. So how can you reframe failure? I think that's what I'm getting at. Um, and that might help with the, the fear of rejection as well. So there might be some commonalities between these two. 
even if you got rejected, you know, how can you reframe that rejection into a redirection? Yes, yeah, there's a lot of those those mindsets out there. And I think to kind of get into those mindsets, I love some of these ideas that folks are talking about, sketching and planning it out instead of the right, getting right into the perfect design. I love that. So more work on the lo-fi stuff and less, you know, focus or fixation on that finished product. Iteration is part of design. A design is never finished. That's a great one. Do things wrong on purpose as an exercise. This gives your mind permission to make mistakes. I love that one. That's a really good one. We actually, as designers, go through bad design activities where we purposely come up with bad ideas. Uh, and then that helps us open up our mindsets and, and think more freely because we're not so focused on coming up with the right thing. I like this one, ask for feedback and for improvement. So that's a great point about iterating and really making sure you're taking feedback. Everyone is unique and brings something different to the job. Yes. Yes, don't worry, go for being authentic. I love that. And I think authenticity is a key to that fear of the competition. Being authentic means that there is no competition. Can you eliminate competition by being authentic and unique? All right. Let's take a look at the not enough time theme. So set a new sleeping and waking up time. Those are really good tactical solutions. Atomic habit at one day at a time. That's a really good one. Make a list of things and identify what you need to do and what you want to do. Do those that you need to do first and then make a timetable of those, great. Faster way of learning, audio while driving or video while taking the train. Yes, I love this one. This is a really great one. Create a rule for yourself. Even if it's just 10 minutes a day, you are still getting closer to the goal. Set aside short increments of time to read or work on a project and change habits if you want to try something different today. Work with a buddy who wants to accomplish the same thing. Yes, these are all really good ones. And I think it's also about priorities. I think, um, Whenever I realize I'm not doing something that I wanted to do, I realize that maybe I actually didn't want to do that thing. And that maybe that was like the idealized version of myself that was supposed to do the thing, like read a good book, which I never do. Um, but then the real version of me doesn't do that thing. So I think one thing is really thinking about your ideal self versus the real self. And if it's something that you've not gotten to and it's been years, then that's maybe not part of your real identity. It's part of your ideal identity. And maybe, maybe don't do it. <laughs> if you're not finding the time to do it, maybe that's your subconscious telling you that they don't, that they don't want you to do it, that you don't want to do it. Um, so I think that's an interesting thing, more of an introspective moment to think about as well. These are all really great solutions. So thank you so much for um, participating and um, articulating them. I think we're seeing that even though a lot of our solutions are very similar, the articulation of those solutions um, creates a sense of nuance to that same problem. Uh, and so we have different nuances with our solutions as well.
All right. So we have 10 more minutes left. And what I'd like you to do is now we can drag and drop at least one or two of our favorite sticky note solutions onto this impact versus effort matrix. So in the design thinking world, we like to vet our different solutions and see you know, is, an, is a solution low effort or high effort? Does it have a high impact or does it have a low impact? And based on where our sticky note solution lands, uh, we should decide to focus on one solution over another solution. So typically if solutions are high impact but low effort, those are, make great MVP solutions or minimum viable product solutions because um, it's easy for a startup to put together that solution have a high impact, but not put in too many resources. If you're working at a corporation, you're more likely to do projects that are both high effort and high impact. Uh, of course, it'll take more effort, uh, but you're probably going to ignore the low effort, low impact or high effort, low impact ideas. So we're really trying to see what's the impact level of some of these solutions. And can we start to be more, um, not judgmental of our ideas, but more um, thoughtful about our ideas, almost start to pressure test our ideas that we're putting out there. So for example, the entrepreneurial mindset, let me drag this. I think that was really high impact, but lower effort. Um, that really changed my mindset for me and it had a big impact on my life. and eliminate the competition. I think this is more high impact, but high effort. Those solutions that are more introspective where it takes time to build, to think through you know, how you want to approach things, it'll take more time to achieve that end goal. Same thing with the ideal self versus real self. I think that's more high impact. So maybe somewhere here. Oh, and Dinah, to you know, heart something, you just click on the sticky note and then you'll see this horizontal navigation bar pop up and you'll click on the add emoji button and then you can click heart like that. All right. Great to see everyone placing some ideas. Actually, I think I can, now that I'm starting to place some of my sticky notes, I might actually say, actually this ideal self versus real self, it's high effort, but it also has a low impact because now that I think more about that idea, I feel like we're always in this battle with ourselves about what's our ideal self versus the real self. And does that, you know, maybe we need to be in that battle to um, get better and actually read that design book that we were supposed to read. Um, because if we didn't have that battle with ourselves, we would never change. So maybe that's actually not as impactful to kind of think about that too much. So now I'm again, continuing to pressure test my ideas and uh, downgrade some of my ideas because I need to be more critical of my ideas and not all my ideas are good. Some of them need more nuance. They need to be more fleshed out. So what's uh, exciting to do in these types of exercises is to dump a bunch of sticky notes on this board, but then sleep on it, give it a day and come back to it and then start to rearrange the sticky notes because what you'll find is that maybe you are a little overzealous about all your ideas. Like all of us right now have really high impact amazing ideas, but we're, you know, we ourselves are more scared to say, well, hmm, is that actually a good idea or is that a bad idea? Is that actually a low impact idea? And so coming back to it and sleeping on it helps us be a little bit more critical of, actually, this might be a bad idea, things like that. All right. So with the last five minutes, we actually got through a lot of our activities earlier than planned. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing and, you know, just give this time to you to kind of ask any questions or network with the rest of the group, um, up to you on how you want to use the last five minutes.
Anyone? Any last questions? You can keep working in the mirror board, up to you. And feel free to add your LinkedIn on here too, if you wanted to network with some of the folks uh, who were joining us today. Yes, you really can use design thinking for anything. This is actually one of the first times I've been a designer for seven years, but I have never really used it to design a more thoughtful life for myself. So this is a, a new territory for me as well uh, of design thinking for our own life. I think that's the hardest thing we could do because we're the most biased about our own lives and our own um, mannerisms. Yes, design is never finished. So yep, there is no one good answer really. But we can just become more and more confident about our solutions and answers. And Sonia, to your point, we also use design thinking for furniture design projects, physical product design projects, service design, um, interior design and architecture. Uh, when I went to the product design school at Penn, we had to complete design courses in all these different um, uh, specialties and design thinking was the core of everything. Yes. And it's really even whether you're designing a, a space or a, a process or a service, really diving deep into the problem is the key part. Because uh, to your point, 40% uh, of startups fail because they don't solve the right problem. They just solve a fake problem, a fictional problem and that nobody really cares about. Um, so if we really do our research and really understand the right problem to solve, we're more likely to be successful. And if you really want to you know, learn more about these mindset shifts as you learn design thinking, that's what we do in our four month program. So a lot of what we do with our one-on-one -on -one mentorship as our cohort members go through the course is those mindset shifts, that acceptance of failure, that entrepreneurial mindset, uh, that ability to keep iterating and not fall in love with any one idea. Uh, and that ability to let go of the perfectionist in you. A lot of what we do is, yes, anyone can teach design or there's so many different design resources out there, but it's really the mindset shifts that help certain people become more successful designers in the field and practice design more successfully. And it's really about the mindset shifts more than anything. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. And um, I will see you hopefully for a new session very soon. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sonia. Uh, can you share your slide and share the mirror board? Uh, so actually, I reuse these Miro boards, but if you would like to take a copy, you can make your own free Miro board account and you can copy the boards. You have edit access. Um, but yeah, feel free to, to, you know, copy the board if, if you want to go back to it or take a screenshot of it. Um, that could be a great way as well. But thank you so much. I won't be emailing the boards, but what I do do is I have recorded the session. So this will be on our YouTube channel and I can email you the recording. Awesome, great to see you again, Calvin. Great, thank you everyone.